Nocturnal aneurysis, Wikipedia article audio. Nocturnal aneurysis, also called bedwetting, is involuntary urination while asleep after the age at which bladder control usually occurs. Bedwetting in children and adults can result in emotional stress. Complications can include urinary tract infections. Classification Primary nocturnal aneurysis Secondary nocturnal aneurysis Psychological definition Impact Self-esteem Behavioral impact Punishment for bedwetting Families Sociopathy Causes Unconfirmed Mechanism Diagnosis Voiding diary Physical examination Treatment Effective Condition management Unproven Epidemiology History most bedwetting is a developmental delay not an emotional problem or physical illness. Only a small percentage of bedwetting cases are caused by specific medical situations. Bedwetting is frequently associated with a family history of the condition. Nocturnal aneurysis is considered primary when a child has not yet had a prolonged period of being dry. Secondary nocturnal aneurysis is when a child or adult begins wetting again after having stayed dry. Treatments range from behavioral-based options such as bedwetting alarms, to medication such as hormone replacement, and even surgery such as urethral enlargement. Since most bedwetting is simply a developmental delay, most treatment plans aim to protect or improve self-esteem. Treatment guidelines recommend that the physician counsel the parents, warning about psychological damage caused by pressure, shaming, or punishment for a condition children cannot control. Bedwetting is the most common childhood complaint. Most girls stay dry by age 6 and most boys stay dry by age 7. By 10 years old, 95% of children are dry at night. Studies place adult bedwetting rates at between 0.5% and 2.3%. The medical name for bedwetting is nocturnal aneurysis. The condition is divided into two types, primary nocturnal aneurysis and secondary nocturnal aneurysis. Primary nocturnal aneurysis is the most common form of bedwetting. Bedwetting counts as a disorder once a child is old enough to stay dry, but continues either to average at least two wet nights a week with no long periods of dryness or to not sleep dry without being taken to the toilet by another person. New studies show that antipsychotic drugs can have a side effect of triggering aneurysis. It has been shown that diet impacts aneurysis in children. Constipation and impacted bowels from poor diet can back up stool in the colon, putting undue pressure on the bladder creating loss of bladder control. Medical guidelines vary on when a child is old enough to stay dry. Common medical definitions allow doctors to diagnose pine beginning at between 4 and 5 years old. This type of classification is frequently used by insurance companies. It defines pine as, persistent bedwetting in the absence of any urologic, medical or neurological anomaly in a child beyond the age when over 75% of children are normally dry. Some researchers, however, recommend a different starting age range. This guidance says that bedwetting can be considered a clinical problem if the child regularly wets the bed after turning 7 years old.
D'Alessandro refines this to bedwetting more than twice a month after six years old for girls and seven years old for boys. Secondary enuresis occurs after a patient goes through an extended period of dryness at night and then reverts to nighttime wetting. Secondary enuresis can be caused by emotional stress or a medical condition, such as a bladder infection. Psychologists may use a definition from the American Psychiatric Association SDSM-4. Defining nocturnal enuresis as repeated urination into bed or clothes, occurring twice per week or more for at least three consecutive months in a child of at least five years of age and not due to either a drug side effect or a medical condition. Even if the case does not meet these criteria, the DSM-4 definition allows psychologists to diagnose nocturnal enuresis if the wetting causes the patient clinically significant distress. A review of medical literature shows doctors consistently stressing that a bedwetting child is not at fault for the situation. Many medical studies state that the psychological impacts of bedwetting are more important than the physical considerations. It is often the child's and family members' reaction to bedwetting that determines whether it is a problem or not. Whether bedwetting causes low self-esteem remains a subject of debate, but several studies have found that self-esteem improved with management of the condition. Children questioned in one study ranked bedwetting as the third most stressful life event, after parental divorce and parental fighting. Adolescents in the same study ranked bedwetting as tied for second with parental fighting. Bedwetters face problems ranging from being teased by siblings, being punished by parents, the embarrassment of still having to wear diapers, and being afraid that friends will find out. Psychologists report that the amount of psychological harm depends on whether the bedwetting harms self-esteem or development of social skills. Key factors are Studies show that bedwetting children are more likely to have behavioral problems. For children who have developmental problems, the behavioral problems and the bedwetting are frequently part of slash caused by the developmental issues. For bedwetting children without other developmental issues, these behavioral issues can result from self-esteem issues and stress caused by the wetting. As mentioned below, current studies show that it is very rare for a child to intentionally wet the bed as a method of acting out. Medical literature states, and studies show, that punishing or shaming a child for bedwetting will frequently make the situation worse. Doctors describe a downward cycle where a child punished for bedwetting feels shame and a loss of self-confidence. This can cause increased bedwetting incidents, leading to more punishment and shaming. In the United States, about 25% of anuritic children are punished for wetting the bed. In Hong Kong, 57% of anuritic children are punished for wetting. Parents with only a grade school level education punish bedwetting children at twice the rate of high school and college educated parents. Parents and family members are frequently stressed by a child's bedwetting. Soiled linens and clothing cause additional laundry. Wedding episodes can cause lost sleep if the child wakes and slash or cries, waking the parents. A European study estimated that a family with a child who wets nightly will pay about $1,000 a year for additional laundry, extra sheets, disposable absorbent garments such as diapers, and mattress replacement. Despite these stressful effects, Doctors emphasize that parents should react patiently and supportively. Bedwetting does not indicate a greater possibility of being a sociopath, as long as caregivers do not cause trauma by shaming or punishing a bedwetting child. Bedwetting was part of the McDonald Triad, 
a set of three behavioral characteristics described by John MacDonald in 1963. The other two characteristics were fire starting and animal abuse. MacDonald suggested that there was an association between a person displaying all three characteristics, then later displaying sociopathic criminal behavior. MacDonald observed in his most sadistic patients a triad of childhood cruelty to animals, fire setting, and enuresis or frequent bedwetting. Such maladaptive childhood behaviors often result from poorly developed coping mechanisms. This triad, although not intended to predict criminal behavior, provides the warning signs of a child under considerable stress. Children under substantial stress, particularly in their home environment, frequently engage in maladaptive behaviors, such as these, in order to alleviate the stress produced by their surroundings. Up to 60% of multiple murderers, according to some estimates, wet their beds post-adolescence. Enuresis is an unconscious, involuntary, and nonviolent act and therefore linking it to violent crime is more problematic than doing so with animal cruelty or fire setting. Bedwetting can be connected to emotional or physical trauma. Trauma can trigger a return to bedwetting in both children and adults. In addition, Caregivers cause some level of emotional trauma when they punish or shame a bedwetting child. This leads to a difficult distinction, it is not the bedwetting that increases the chance of criminal behavior, but the trauma. For example, parental cruelty can result in homicidal proneness. The etiology of NE is not fully understood, although there are three common causes excessive urine volume, poor sleep arousal, and bladder contractions. Differentiation of cause is mainly based on patient history and fluid charts completed by the parent or carer to inform management options. The following list summarizes bedwetting's known causes and risk factors. Inuritic patients frequently have more than one cause or risk factor from the items listed below. How much the bedwetting limits social activities like sleepovers and campouts, the degree of the social ostracism by peers, anger, punishment, and rejection by caregivers, the number of failed treatment attempts, how long the child has been wetting. Neurological developmental delay, this is the most common cause of bedwetting. Most bedwetting children are simply delayed in developing the ability to stay dry and have no other developmental issues. Studies suggest that bedwetting may be due to a nervous system that is slow to process the feeling of a full bladder. Genetics Bedwetting has a strong genetic component. Children whose parents were not aneuritic have only a 15% incidence of bedwetting. When one or both parents were bedwetters, the rates jumped to 44% and 77% respectively. Genetic research shows that bedwetting is associated with the genes on chromosomes 1-3-Q and 12 quetzales. Alcohol consumption, drinking alcohol increases urine production, inhibits antidiuretic hormone production, decreases awareness, increases drowsiness, and causes impulsive decisions, antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone regulates urine production by increasing water reabsorption in the kidney. Both insufficient production of ADH, or insufficient response to ADH, leads to an overproduction of urine often beyond the capacity of a child's bladder. The body normally increases ADH levels at night, signaling the kidneys to produce less urine. The diurnal change may not be seen until about age 10. In some bedwetting children this increase in ADH production does not occur, while other children may produce an increased amount of ADH but their response is insufficient attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 
children with ADHD are 2.7 times more likely to have bedwetting issues, caffeine, caffeine increases urine production, constipation, chronic constipation can cause bedwetting. When the bowels are full, it can put pressure on the bladder. Often such children defecate normally, yet they retain a significant mass of material in the bowel which causes bed wetting, infection slash disease, infections and disease are more strongly connected with secondary nocturnal enuresis and with daytime wetting. Less than 5% of all bed wetting cases are caused by infection or disease the most common of which is a urinary tract infection, more severe neurological developmental issues, patients with intellectual disabilities have a higher rate of bedwetting problems. One study of seven-year-olds showed that handicapped and intellectually disabled children had a bedwetting rate almost three times higher than non-handicapped children. Physical abnormalities Less than 10% of aneuritics have urinary tract abnormalities, such as a smaller than normal bladder. Current data does support increased bladder tone in some aneuritics, which functionally would decrease bladder capacity. Psychological, psychological issues are established as a cause of secondary nocturnal aneurysis, but are very rarely a cause of pine-type bedwetting. Bedwetting can also be a symptom of a pediatric neuropsychological disorder called PANDAS. When enuresis is caused by a psychological or neuropsychological disorder, the bedwetting is considered a symptom of the disorder. Enuresis has a psychological diagnosis code, but it is not considered a psychological condition itself. Sleep apnea Sleep apnea stemming from an upper airway obstruction has been associated with bedwetting. Snoring and enlarged tonsils or adenoids are a sign of potential sleep apnea problems. Sleepwalking Sleepwalking can lead to bedwetting. During sleepwalking, the sleepwalker may think he slash she is in another room. When the sleepwalker urinates during a sleepwalking episode, he slash she usually thinks they are in the bathroom, and therefore urinate where they think the toilet should be. Cases of this have included opening a closet and urinating in it, urinating on the sofa and simply urinating in the middle of the room. Stress Stress is not a cause of primary nocturnal enuresis, but is well established as a cause of returning to bedwetting. Researchers studying children who have yet to stay dry find no relationship to social background, life stresses, family constellation, or number of residencies. On the other hand, stress is a cause of people who return to wetting the bed. Researchers find that moving to a new town, parent conflict or divorce, arrival of a new baby, or loss of a loved one or pet can cause insecurity, contributing to returning bedwetting, type 1 diabetes mellitus, nocturnal aneurysis could be the presenting symptom of type 1 diabetes mellitus, classically associated with polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia, weight loss, lethargy, and diaper candidiasis may also be present in those with new onset disease. Motivational therapy in nocturnal enuresis mainly involves parent and child education. Guilt should be allayed by providing facts. Fluids should be restricted two hours prior to bed. The child should be encouraged to empty the bladder completely prior to going to bed. Positive reinforcement can be initiated by setting up a diary or chart to monitor progress and establishing a system to reward the child for each night that he or she is dry. The child should participate in morning cleanup as a natural, non-punitive consequence of wetting. This method is particularly helpful in younger children and will achieve dryness in 15 to 20 percent of the patients, waiting. Almost all children will outgrow bedwetting. 
For this reason, urologists and pediatricians frequently recommend delaying treatment until the child is at least 6 or 7 years old. Physicians may begin treatment earlier if they perceive the condition is damaging the child's self-esteem and slash or relationships with family slash friends, bedwetting alarms. Physicians also frequently suggest bedwetting alarms which sound a loud tone when they sense moisture. This can help condition the child to wake at the sensation of a full bladder. These alarms are considered effective with study participants being 13 times more likely to become dry at night. There is a 29% to 69% relapse rate, however, so the treatment may need to be repeated. DDAVP tablets are a synthetic replacement for antidiuretic hormone, the hormone that reduces urine production during sleep. Desmopressin is usually used in the form of desmopressin acetate, DDAVP. Patients taking DDAVP are 4.5 times more likely to stay dry than those taking a placebo. The drug replaces the hormone for that night with no cumulative effect. U.S. drug regulators have banned using desmopressin nasal sprays for treating bedwetting since the oral form is considered safer. DDAVP is most efficient in children with nocturnal polyuria and normal bladder reservoir function. Other children who are likely candidates for desmopressin treatment are those in whom alarm therapy has failed or those considered unlikely to comply with alarm therapy. It can be very useful for summer camp and sleepovers to prevent enuresis, tricyclic antidepressants, Tricyclic antidepressant prescription drugs with anti-muscarinic properties have been proven successful in treating bedwetting, but also have an increased risk of side effects, including death from overdose. These drugs include amitriptyline, imipramine, and nortriptyline. Studies find that patients using these drugs are 4.2 times as likely to stay dry as those taking a placebo. The relapse rates after stopping the medicines are close to 50%. Age 5, 20%, age 6, 10-15%, age 7, 7%, age 10, 5%, age 15, 1-2%, age 18, 64, 0.51%. Bedwetting Resource Center by European Urology, University of Chicago Most cases of bedwetting are pine type, which has two related most common causes. These first two items are the most common factors in bedwetting, but current medical technology offers no easy testing for either cause. There is no test to prove that bedwetting is only a developmental delay and genetic testing offers little or no benefit. As a result, other conditions should be ruled out. The following causes are less common, but are easier to prove and more clearly treated. Two physical functions prevent bedwetting. The first is a hormone that reduces urine production at night. The second is the ability to wake up when the bladder is full. Children usually achieve nighttime dryness by developing one or both of these abilities. There appear to be some hereditary factors in how and when these develop. The first ability is a hormone cycle that reduces the body's urine production. At about sunset each day, the body releases a minute burst of antidiuretic hormone. This hormone burst reduces the kidney's urine output well into the night so that the bladder does not get full until morning. This hormone cycle is not present at birth. Many children develop it between the ages of 2 and 6 years old, others between 6 and the end of puberty, and some not at all. The second ability that helps people stay dry is waking when the bladder is full. This ability develops in the same age range as the vasopressin hormone, but is separate from that hormone cycle. 
the typical development process begins with one- and two-year-old children developing larger bladders and beginning to sense bladder fullness. Two- and three-year-old children begin to stay dry during the day. Four- and five-year-olds develop an adult pattern of urinary control and begin to stay dry at night. Thorough history regarding frequency of bedwetting, any period of dryness in between, associated daytime symptoms, constipation, and encapresis should be sought. There are a number of management options for bedwetting. The following options apply when the bedwetting is not caused by a specifically identifiable medical condition such as a bladder abnormality or diabetes. Treatment is recommended when there is a specific medical condition such as bladder abnormalities, infection, or diabetes. It is also considered when bedwetting may harm the child's self-esteem or relationships with family slash friends. Only a small percentage of bedwetting is caused by a specific medical condition, so most treatment is prompted by concern for the child's emotional welfare. Behavioral treatment of bedwetting overall tends to show increased self-esteem for children. Parents become concerned much earlier than doctors. A study in 1980 asked parents and physicians the age that children should stay dry at night. The average parent response was 2.75 years old, while the average physician response was 5.13 years old. Punishment is not effective and can interfere with treatment. Simple behavioral methods are recommended as initial treatment. Enuresis alarm therapy and medications may be more effective but have potential side effects. Most girls can stay dry at night by age 6 and most boys stay dry by age 7. Boys are three times more likely to wet the bed than girls. Doctors frequently consider bedwetting as a self-limiting problem, since most children will outgrow it. Children 5 to 9 years old have a spontaneous cure rate of 14% per year. Adolescents 10 to 18 years old have a spontaneous cure rate of 16% per year. Approximate bedwetting rates are As can be seen from the numbers above, a portion of bedwetting children will not outgrow the problem. Adult rates of bedwetting show little change due to spontaneous cure. Persons who are still enuretic at age 18 are likely to deal with bedwetting throughout their lives. Studies of bedwetting in adults have found varying rates. The most quoted study in this area was done in the Netherlands. It found a 0.5% rate for 18 to 64 year olds. A Hong Kong study, however, found a much higher rate. The Hong Kong researchers found a bedwetting rate of 2.3% in 16- to 40-year-olds. An early psychological perspective on bedwetting was given in 1025 by Avicenna in the Canon of Medicine. Urinating in bed is frequently predisposed by deep sleep, when urine begins to flow, its inner nature and hidden will drives urine out before the child awakes. When children become stronger and more robust, their sleep is lighter and they stop urinating. Psychological theory through the 1960s placed much greater focus on the possibility that a bedwetting child might be acting out, purposefully striking back against parents by soiling linens and bedding. However, more recent research and medical literature states that this is very rare.